I am hearing and some are static we, noise. Are we live on uh, the YouTube channel and Facebook as well? We should be. Let me just double check right now. It'll probably. Cool. I don't want to open it up and have it echo and stuff. So. I see. Yeah, I see it's live on ours. Let me just check yours, frenemies. Frenemies. Benjamin, are we live on Frenemies Drift? They may have just a bit of a delay. Yeah, I'm seeing it live on ours. I'm just waiting for Frenemies. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Hi, Doug. Hi, Osmos. Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, Doug. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I does? Hello. Doug said he's uh, working. Hopefully, you're uh, not at work on company time watching this, but I hope kind of you are. <laughs> Cool. All right, guys, we are going to get started oh. in about three minutes, and I hope you have some amazing questions for Odie. Ready yeah, to see, go. Uh, someone said Labas, which means high in Lithuanian, so Sveikas Labas, back to you in Lithuanian. Nice. What time is it? Oh, in, another um, Lithuanian. Sweet. What, what, time, what time is it, is it in Lithuania? Yeah, you guys from Lithuania, what, what time are you at? It's probably late. <laughs> it's, if it's anything like um, British time right now, it's already 10 o'clock in the evening. Hello, Elias. Yeah. Hello, Clubson. Nice for you to join us all the way from yes. um, Brazil. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Perfect. Midnight. Hey, see, I wasn't kidding. Odemus, my full name is Common. See, there's another one with that same name, Odemus, popping up in the chat. So. Ah, okay. Uh, it's, it's nice to see okay. that it's uh, it pops up in Lithuania or in the U.S. It's really, really uh, rare to see that name pop up. Perfect. Hello, Jack. Good to see you. Yeah. Good what's up, you. Jack? Sweet. What does that mean, Labas? Am I pronouncing Labas that right? means means hello in Lithuania. So we got. We got a lot of oh from UK Hello. as well. Yeah, we got uh, we got a lot of Euros here, which is cool. Hi from Even Argentina. Like, oh, what's up, Thomas? Yeah, so I met Thomas in Florida, Formula Drift, Orlando. Sweet. From all over. Fantastic. Well, thank cool. you for joining so we got us. One both minute. Of you. Where it is midnight, so thank you for doing that. <laughs> Hello, New Zealand. Wow, that's got to be something like, oh, wait, Heck yeah. that shouldn't be too bad. Yes, we will be doing questions. So we'll start in one minute, yeah. and I'll just explain. Wow, Mexico. Hello. Yeah. So someone asks, is this the fuel suspension shop? Um, actually, we're at my race shop. It's a separate building from fuel suspension. This is where... We keep the fuel suspension drift cars. You got the S14 right behind me, the white hook poking through right there. And then you have my demo car, the teal and blue Falcon car behind that. You got my airbag truck that's in the background. Whoop, move out of the way. And we have a S14 that's being built that's up higher. Um, it's just a bare shell. So this is uh, the race shop. Fuel suspension has its own building where we build the, the coilovers and stuff. Fantastic. Hello from right. Norway. Sweet. Well, it is two o'clock. We We're going to get started, actually. So thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. We've got people from England, from Germany, from Brazil, Norway, and Lithuania, and of course, the US. So thank you very much for doing this. We are so proud to have Odie Bochis join us today. All of you know that he is one of the Falk and Tire Formula Drift Pro drivers, who's had an amazing career. You're right now in eighth place. Are you not, Odie, for this season? Uh, I'm in seventh now. I jumped up a spot, um, but yeah, usually, usually in the top three, this season, <laughs> I have to put in some work. The season's not over, Odie. So for all yeah. of you, the, the game plan today is uh, Odie's going to do a bit of a talk for about 30 minutes talking about um, basic tuning and setup 
especially for Drift. And then we're going to switch gears and then we're going to do 15 minutes Q&A. So if you have any questions for Odie, please type them in the text box. We'll do that for the last 15 minutes. We'll do the giveaway. So for those of you who did all the rules, um, we cut it off yesterday at noon. We'll pick three winners and you'll get a beautiful field suspension hat, a field suspension shirt, and a beautiful um, poster of Odie's 723 Nissan Sylvia. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Odie. There you go. What's up, guys? Uh, thank you so much for joining me uh, in this chat. So um, firstly, I want to thank Throttle for putting this together. I imagine it was not an easy feat to uh, assemble this. And I know there's quite a few people involved to make sure that this uh, works out properly. If you haven't done so already, go to the Throttle app, uh, register, follow me, follow Field Suspension. Uh, I'm stoked that there's a platform like that because it allows people in the automotive industry to chat about automotive things, not a bunch of clutter of other stuff. So it allows you to follow events and uh, get on chats like we're having today right now. So just a uh, huge thanks to Throttle. And thank you guys, uh, you know, for taking the time out to, to join us. Uh, I want to give you guys a special coupon code at Feel Suspension that you could use. Uh, the coupon code is Throttle, uh, really easy to remember, and you'll get 5% off of a coilover purchase if you decide to do that. I'm going to have that go live today. We'll probably run it for about a month. So we never have sales. This is your opportunity if you want a coilover kit. It's a, a little thank you for uh, joining us today. So today I want to go over what I feel like is probably the most overlooked suspension adjustment in a coilover kit. Uh, and we're going to dabble a little bit about uh, damping adjustability on a one-way coilover kit, like a Fuel 441 kit. But before I jump in and start talking suspension setting, settings, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So most of you guys know me. Uh, from Formula Drift, you know, I've been driving in Formula Drift for over 10 years. Currently, I drive the Falcon Tire Fuel Suspension S15. It's a teal and blue Falcon livery car. Uh, but I've been involved in motorsports before I discovered drifting. And I've been involved in the suspension industry, running a suspension business way before I discovered drifting as well. So uh, just a quick rundown of my experience. Starting in high school, I ditched about a week of school. I uh, decided to go and take these uh, suspension seminars that were kind of local in the area. And my parents were somehow nice enough to let me do that. Um, and I got hooked on that. I, I learned a lot. And then obviously I had been teaching myself suspension tuning when I raced motocross, uh, revalving my own forks and shocks. After I got good at doing that, I noticed I was revalving, rebuilding shocks and forks for all my friends uh, that, you know, raced with us um, one thing after another. And then I was running a suspension tuning company. So I started fuel suspension in the early 2000s. It was mainly a motocross tuning suspension company. And I am so thankful that I started tuning suspension in motocross because it's such a competitive sport. The uh, tracks are so gnarly. The ride, there's so many talented riders that um, you have to have every little bit of competitive advantage as you can. And suspension plays a really, really key role in motocross. So uh, I was at many of the race tracks doing trackside support. Worked with a lot of talented pro riders in AMA Supercross and uh, AMA Outdoor Nationals. Uh, a lot of local pros. Um, I've revalved and rebuilt and set up so many shocks over the years uh, when fuel suspension was primarily a, a motocross suspension tuning company. It really built that fundamental understanding of shock valving, spring rates, uh, shock friction, shock design, fluid viscosities. Um, suspension tuning is really precise in motocross, so it really set me up to understand shocks inside and out and understand working with riders and taking feedback and applying it to changes in the suspension and then spitting them right back out to the track and seeing the results firsthand. Um, as my interest went into automotive sports, 
naturally I shifted uh, fuel suspension into offering automotive services and products. And I raced rally for a, a few years um, just for fun. It was a great time. Really awesome uh, applying that suspension knowledge to rally cars. Uh, I had friends and a lot of partners that were road racing. So we went ahead and uh, started setting up shocks of various brands uh, for all those different disciplines of driving. We became a service center for various manufacturers. We rebuilt and serviced um, so many brands of shocks, some that were awesome high-end brands, some that were not great brands, and we learned a lot from the flaws in engineering as well. Around 2011, I decided to seek out manufacturers and find companies that were able to manufacture parts that met our quality standards. And then around 2011, Field Suspension started assembling our own coilovers. We started the Field 441, the one-way adjustable coilover, and uh, then went into 442s, two-way adjustable, 443s. Um, over those years, going into right now, uh, the company has grown a lot. We um, are global in how we sell to Asia, the Middle East, South America. We have a distributor in Europe, and I still am very hands-on with fuel suspension. Uh, I set up most of the new applications that you see on our website. I'm also very involved in motorsports, obviously. I uh, had the chance to travel all over the world and work with different teams and different drivers. So uh, uh, me being that involved pushes the company to stay relevant. And I feel like that's how we're able to prop offer our customers that value uh, in suspension because we're so involved in motorsports. I feel like our stuff is so relevant. The technology and racing keeps on getting better. So we're all going faster, but the racetracks are not getting any smoother. So um, we have drivers in uh, Formula Drift, Drift Masters, um, all over the world really. And um, just very fortunate to work with so many talented people and develop, help develop our product to be more and more relevant. So um, also we're continually doing consulting for other brands that dabble in suspension work. Uh, fuel suspension also private labels suspension for companies that you might be familiar with. Uh, but yeah, bottom line, I want to give you a bit of a rundown of my experience. So, you know, when I speak to you guys about suspension settings, um, I'm hoping to build up confidence that, hey, we've been doing this for a while. And um, I hope that you guys take some of the advice and apply it to your own cars, to your drift cars, road race cars, whatever you're involved with. So um, let's get right into it. Um, we're going to talk about spring preload on coilovers. That seems like a very easy thing to set up, but from my experience working, uh, consulting, working with teams, drivers, it's one of the most overlooked settings. Uh, even a lot of race shops that install coilovers and set up cars overlook setting the spring preload properly. And spring preload is a direct result of suspension droop. So um, why is spring preload so important? Well, spring preload is essentially what determines what stroke your suspension is at at all given times around a racetrack or if you're just cruising down the freeway. Uh, if you don't have enough suspension, uh, enough spring preload, your suspension is very close to the bump stop and it runs the risk of running out of mechanical travel. That could be noticed in a drift car, for instance, if you have amazing traction in a lot of parts of the track, and then randomly in one given turn, you are lacking traction like crazy. That is a sign that you might not have enough preload, for example. A lot of people chase damping adjust adjustments, even spring rate changes to fix that issue, when in reality it might have just been improper spring preload. An example of too much spring preload could be, uh, say, on a fairly high spring rate application in a road race car or the front of a drift car, the suspension will now top out. There's not enough droop because there's too much preload. 
when the suspension tops out, it unloads the tire. You suddenly lose traction and you could be chasing other adjustments to alleviate that when in fact, if you just had set your preload properly, probably wouldn't even have that issue. So some people for too much preload end up cranking in rebound damping. They end up adjusting more and more rebound into the shock to try to slow down the rebound stroke. But in fact, it's the action of the shock running out of mechanical travel is what is unloading the tire, not a lack of rebound damping. So um, yeah, I can't stress enough why spring preload is super important. So let's uh, jump into how to set spring preload. It's not really a magic uh, trick or it's not there's there's no uh, it's it's very easily explained um, let me grab this marker so first things first when you install coilovers yes there's gonna be some predetermined preload most likely out of the box um, let's talk about tuning preload on coilovers that are uh, that have the feature of independent height adjustability and independent spring preload adjustability all feel suspension coilovers have that. If you're choosing a coilover, make sure to look for one that has independent height adjustability, basically a threaded on lower mount and independent uh, spring preload adjustability. For drifting, that's really important because a lot of drift cars have really heavily modified suspension geometry. So for example, if you put um, drop knuckles on the car, like a Y-SPAD kit, and you have a coilover that has a fixed shock body, you can't make the shock shorter or longer you are working in a box. You're not gonna be able to set the right height and then afterwards set the proper preload because you're gonna be setting the preload which is gonna dictate right height. So um, just getting that out of the way, make sure that you're working with a shock that has independent height adjustability. So set the ride height in the ballpark. That's like the first step. I usually try to be within half an inch of where I know I'm gonna want my car to be set up and from there, you can start attacking preload. So set the car on the ground. After you're happy with the ride height, roll it back and forth, make sure the suspension settled. So we're gonna take a few measurements. I'm just gonna draw this out because it's a lot easier to visualize than me just rambling on and hoping that you guys visualize it in your own head. So after the car's on the ground, so you're gonna, basically take a measurement from the fender lift to the center of the wheel hub and we're going to call this measurement x now raise the car up let the suspension droop out all the way and we're going to take that same measurement again through the fender now the wheel is going to be drooped out fender lift to hub center and we're gonna call this measurement Y. Now, if you subtract these two values from one another, uh, you are going to have a measurement that we call droop. So why is it important to know what our droop measurement is? Well, every shock is gonna have a certain amount of travel, let's say, most coilovers for road racing drifting applications are going to have a yield about five inches of, of wheel travel. So droop, when we measure for droop, we're trying to shoot for droop to be about 35% of that total travel that we're working with. Obviously, if droop is 90% of that total travel, that means the car is almost on the bump stop. As soon as you hit bumps, you're going to be on the bump stop. If droop is only 5% of your total travel, that means as soon as you go over a bump and the suspension tries to top out, it's lifting the tires off the ground. So 35% is what we at Field Suspension recommend that you set your droop to. So write that right here. And say we're uh, working with a shock that is five inches of total travel and we're getting, uh, about one and a half inches or two inches of droop after we subtract these two values, that's great. So if you don't wanna do any calculations and it gets a little more tricky and all of this is on the field suspension website. So sometimes your shock doesn't have a direct relationship 
with wheel travel. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship like a Nissan 370Z or a Lexus IS300. There's a motion ratio of leverage on the shock, so the shock compresses far less than the wheel. But we lay out those calculations on the fuel suspension website. But if you want to calculate those things, if you want to just kind of do it as fast as possible, but yet be in the ballpark, from my experience, usually 35% of total travel. Uh, if you're between an inch and a half to two inches and a quarter of droop, you're in the ballpark. So that's a good rule of thumb. It's kind of like uh, a little cheat to get you set up faster if you don't want to do the calculation. So if you're within an inch and a half to 2.25 on this droop value, or you're a little nerdy and like to do math, shoot for 35% of that, then you're gonna be fine. Uh, also, take notes. Um, I'll answer questions at the end of this, especially if some of this is fuzzy or this prompts a different question, just hold tight and um, there's gonna be an opportunity for me to answer some more of this. So that's setting up suspension group and I hope you guys use this knowledge and this info. It, I promise you it makes a world of a difference. I work with drivers all the time that overlook this. So um, we got a little bit more time. Um, let's talk about how to set up the damping adjustability on a one-way adjustable shock. And let's talk about a one-way adjustable shock because one, that's the most common coilover um, system that is out there. Uh, it's obviously more affordable than a two-way or three-way adjustable shock. And I think that if the one-way adjustable coilover is set up properly, you could definitely be very competitive on it. So one-way adjustable shock means that there's one knob to adjust compression and rebound. Usually both are adjusted simultaneously. One-way shocks favor adjusting rebound more than compression. That's just the physics of how the circuitry works inside of it. Um, there's usually multiple clicks. So field coilovers, for example, have 30 clicks of adjustability. Zero clicks is full stiff. 30 clicks is full soft. Get into the habit of talking about adjustments in that way. So always go full soft, which is clockwise, and then count out clicks. And that's a very common way for a lot of suspension uh, engineers and tuners across different styles or driving disciplines uh, to communicate. So it's a great habit to, to communicate clicks that way between you and your team. Um, so a really important aspect to adjusting a one-way shock is to make sure that the shock you're working with has incremental adjustments throughout that range, meaning that the first five clicks aren't basically doing all the adjustment and then the last 20 clicks do almost nothing because that's going to throw you for a loop. You're not going to be able to understand why there's no action after you adjust your coilover. Um, so make sure that you have the confidence that the shock's actually making adjustments. Obviously, field coilovers have an incremental adjustability all the way across the range. So when you're tuning that shock, feel confident that if you're in the middle of the settings towards full soft or full stiff, you're still going to have good resolution with every click. So um, let's get into some examples of if a shock, if a car has a coilover kit on it that is behaving uh, in a way that is too soft. So in instances where you would have to um, increase the compression or rebound damping, you'd have to make it stiffer. So I'm going to give you three common examples because we could sit here all day and uh, the car's doing this, adjust that, but I'm going to give you three common ones if your coilovers are too soft. Um, so number one, too much body roll or dive. And this could be very evident um, at a racetrack on a road race car. In a drift car, it's also very evident. Say, for example, if you go to initiate, the car is just unstable. It moves around too much. On transitions, there's a lot of body roll when you're transitioning from one angle to the other or going into a decel zone, the car just dives way too much and it's changing your suspension geometry from that. Then in that case, I recommend going firmer on the damping adjustment and I recommend adjusting five clicks at a time. 
because we don't have usually at the track enough time to adjust one click, trial and error, come back, adjust one at a time. We're just going to run out of time. We're going to run a fuel or tires. Five clicks at a time is a great way to start. And then you can fine tune the adjustments one click at a time from there. So a second characteristic of a car that has too soft of coilovers and needs to be adjusted to be firmer is a car that's oscillating too many times after hitting a bump. An example of that is in Formula Drift. If you look at the Orlando venue in Florida, there's a series of bumps in the infield. And if a car gets over that bump and yet still keeps oscillating afterwards, that's an indication that the coilovers could use a little bit more compression and or rebound damping to settle the car. Um, in that case, adjust clockwise, firmer, five clicks at a time once again, and then you could fine tune one click at a time from there. The third one, third example of a car that might be too soft, needing to go stiffer, is just blowing through the suspension stroke. So if um, this is evident on tracks that are obviously a little more bumpy, but it's also evident on really high horsepower cars that make a lot of grip because that especially if a car lacks a bit of anti-squat, it really cycles through the suspension on power. Um, the bump stop does such a good job of absorbing that energy, so sometimes it's kind of tricky to know if the suspension is blowing through the travel. Uh, this is, you know, it could get a little tricky to diagnose this, but to alleviate it blowing through the stroke, go firmer, five clicks at a time, until the car starts to not get through all of this travel and uh, be more predictable. So those are all examples of the coilovers being too soft and uh, <clears throat> going firmer five clicks at a time is, is definitely the, if the coilovers are valved and set up properly, uh, using those setup tips will get you to a, a good spot. Um, let's talk about characteristics of coilovers that are set too firm. And once again, I'm gonna give you three examples of what the car might be doing. And in that case, adjust to be softer. So uh, number one, traction breaks away on turning. This could be seen on a road race car approaching a turn. It, if you turn in, it just starts to push, the front end pushes, or the rear kicks out like uncontrollable or uh, unpredictable oversteer. On a drift car, there's so many parts around the track that this could be evident as well. Uh, initiating with a feint and then the car starts to break loose uh, as you're fainting before you actually want to initiate. Transitions, if the front starts to wash in a transition. For example, Seattle, Formula Drift Seattle, the bank's really long, you drift with fairly shallow angle because it's so fast the front has a tendency to wash if your front coilovers are too firm. In any of those situations, uh, you can alleviate that by going softer five clicks at a time once again until the car starts to feel proper and then you can fine tune one click at a time. So the second example is the car moving too much with the irregularities on the track. All tracks have some bumps and usually the suspension soaks it up, so you don't really even notice it as a driver. Uh, but if the coilover is set uh, too stiff, then the car would start to actually follow all the imperfections of the surface, and that could throw you offline. Um, it's kind of difficult to navigate a track that's giving you too much feedback. So if the suspension is actually not moving, not compressing enough, and the chassis is following all the imperfections, go softer five clicks at a time until you start to uh, have consistency in your line and your chassis and being jolted and then you can fine tune one click at a time from there. Uh, lastly, harshness over big bumps or square edge bumps. So if your suspension is too stiff, if you need to adjust uh, for less compression and or rebound damping, um, you'll you could feel harshness going over a bigger bump or a square edge bump. That obviously could load the tire in an unnecessary way. It'll, uh, you're definitely going to lose traction. Uh, it could throw you offline. So that would be an instance where you adjust counterclockwise, softer, five clicks at a time as well.
um, as I close out the damping adjustability, that last one is a good segue to remind you guys that if you feel harshness in your suspension, sometime, and right now we're talking that, hey, the suspension might be too stiff, you need to soften it up. Sometimes, and this is through my experience of working with, with teams and uh, consulting with other companies that run race cars, sometimes in fact, it could be that the suspension is way too soft and you're blowing into the bump stop harshly and that gives you that harshness. I've worked with with companies uh, that end up chasing softer valving, softer spring rates, and it exaggerates the problem because they were just blowing through the stroke because the shock was actually too soft. So uh, that brings me to a point uh, that you sometimes have to do trial and error. I just ran over some very common scenarios, but don't be ashamed that maybe you as a driver or the crew that you have might not be able to pinpoint what it is that your car needs more of. If it needs to be softer or stiffer, sometimes it could get kind of cloudy. Um, so you need to just adjust sometimes a lot softer and then start to adjust firmer until you find which one's actually resolving the issue. So just laying that out there, uh, not everyone's a, a test driver and I've worked with plenty that don't get consistent feedback. So sometimes you just have to resort to trial and error. Um, jam through this pretty quick for you guys. I really hope that uh, you took some of this in. If you didn't, we do have a lot of these resources on the fuel suspension website. There's actually a full article on how important droop or spring preload is. And there's a guide to the adjustment, uh, damping adjustments as well. Um, I'd like to give us some time for some uh, questions to pop in and, and answer them for you guys. So um, yeah, I'm gonna hang tight. Let's see what you guys got. Private chat, let's see. Okay, so uh, Joseph replies, let me just read this. Yes, but you still gotta have the power and the tire compound. Soft setups are often very grippy, whereas hard makes it prone to rotate. You know, that's a really cool um, topic because when I started my formula drift career, for instance, I've ran some tires that weren't the grippiest early on in my career. And yes, we found as a suspension company that even reducing um, anti-squat, going softer on compression valving, softer on spring rates, uh, sometimes yields more grip, more mechanical grip. But it's really important to know that there's a threshold to that. Um, right now, for instance, I'm running a Falcon 295, a huge sticky tire. We had to change valving strategy and spring rate strategy so much in my car when I started running bigger, grippier tires because at a certain point, a really soft suspension doesn't load the tire properly. Uh, there's actually graphs on this and um, some vehicle dynamics books. There's a certain point where um, you need to start loading the tire more in order to make more grip. So soft suspension bottom line at a certain point starts to diminish grip. So you really have to find that threshold and then you have to make sure you stay within it. Uh, but every tire is different. So soft, really soft suspension on really grippy tires. Sometimes, uh, sometimes you leave some, some traction on the table. That, that was okay. a, that was a great comment though. Okay. So we now have a question from Chris. He goes, will feel suspension be selling air cuts like the ones that you teased weeks ago? Yeah. So short answer is we'd love to do that for sure. We are doing a little bit more testing on it. But man, uh, they work really well when we uh, did the initial test. I actually have uh, even full airbags that we tested and um, we're just running through all the, all the checks, make sure everything is the way we want it. And we hope to bring that to the market really soon. Perfect. We've got another question here from Ellen who says, when should I go to fields 442 rather than the 441s? That's a great question. So if you are getting to the point where you're adjusting your 441s and you would like to see 
even more adjustability, then go to the 442. Um, if you have the budget and you're not shy to adjust it, jump into it right away. Because the 442, not only is it more adjustability in general, you have the ability to adjust rebound and compression completely separate from one another. That's a deeper topic for me to talk about, but if you, when you purchase a Fuel 442 kit, it actually comes with a setup guide that goes in detail of how to adjust the rebound and the compression separately. We don't publish that. Um, it kind of comes with the territory of purchasing that kit. We put a lot of effort into that tuning guide and it is something that we give you uh, once you get a 442 kit. Okay, we have two questions from Jack Rouse. This one is, do you bring a shock dyno to the track? And the second one is, do you change fluid in the shocks after every event? That's an interesting question. Uh, so in drifting, we do not bring a shock dyno to the track. And that's because we've got, we had so much dyno time at our shop on so many various uh, valving profiles that we, we, we know what each basically setting is going to yield. And we try to tune the, say for instance, the compression uh, range in our reservoirs to have about 300 pounds of force adjustability. So it gives us a really wide range, working range, and we don't really have to deviate from that at any given track. There's definitely been instances where we go to a new venue and I go, man, I'd like more of this out of my car. And I go back to feel, we run some stuff on the shock dyno and alter the valving for the future. Uh, and then to answer your question about changing fluid in the shock, no, we don't change the fluid at every single round. Um, we use really high viscosity index fluid made by Lucas Oil that we buy directly from them. And the, the shock fluid comes out really clean. All the components, internal components of our shocks are anodized and coated. So there's not really debris that we see in the shock fluid itself and the heat cycles of drifting and some of the like time attack teams that we work with aren't really high to really degrade that fluid as much as what we used to see in uh, like motocross applications. Perfect. Okay. The next question comes from Elias. What makes the IS 300 a special case when it comes to calculating droop? So the IS 300, especially in the front has so much leverage on the front shock that, um, one, the spring rate has to be way higher. Uh, and then the shock cycles about uh, off the top of my head, I'd have to look at my notes about, I think 0.7 of what the actual wheel travels. So you would have, there's a motion ratio multiplier. It's really not that difficult to calculate. Just hop on our website and, and check out the tips on it. But just keep in mind that very little uh, shock travel yields a lot of wheel travel on a Lexus IS 300. Okay. And we have another question from Plan D. How important are spring rates? Can you swap springs with the same coilover? Yeah, spring rates are really important. So there's a term called natural frequency that um, we shoot for a certain natural frequency. And in order to achieve that, that, that natural frequency is kind of the term that we use to uh, measure firmness of the suspension system. And then to achieve that, we have to obviously put in a softer or stiffer spring. So that's calculated by us using some spreadsheets based off of the customer's car, based on the weight, uh, motion ratio of the suspension. So if a company chooses the right baseline spring, you're pretty good. And then I always encourage people to deviate two kilograms up or down to fine tune. And to answer your question about what, how you can swap springs without changing the shock or changing the valving, if the shock is properly built as like a robust and good piston inside of it uh, and has good range, you could deviate plus or minus two kilograms without an issue and still have adjustability. Okay, we've got a really technical question here from Dylan Marsh. How is is using I hope I said that. Nadine, can I see this uh, comment? Cause you're breaking up a little bit. Where's the, or Alex, do you have that? that question Nadine can you hear me okay 
Uh, we're going to find your question in a second. Hey, Odie, it's Benjamin. I think I found oh. it. Yeah, so I think I found it too. Dylan, you're okay. asking if we have a range of uh, ride. Let me see that. Ride frequencies. Yeah, if we have a range of ride frequencies for uh, street road racing. Yeah, absolutely. We do. And uh, that's really important. So, especially for disciplines of driving like drifting, where we split the frequencies quite a bit from front to rear, it's kind of almost an unorthodox way of doing it. But we found that that yields really good traction and the dynamics that are required of drifting for a car to be quick we do that a lot so yeah absolutely we we have ranges um that we stick to that's why our sales guys have proprietary spreadsheets that i created for them uh for mike if you ever call fuel suspension and that's one of the first things he's going to ask you is what compound tire are you using uh if you did any weight modifications if you have aero on your car because all of that is a, a variable that goes into our equation when we're cal calculating the ride frequency. And obviously the baseline ride frequency for each application starts out at a different level. And then from the variables that, from just the questions we ask you about your car, we input different values in there and then we get the, the correct ride frequency. But great question, man. Okay, we've got a question from Andrew. How about difference between adjusting front versus rear? That's a great question. I actually meant to, throw that in when I was talking about damping adjustability, even in a one-way adjustable shock, we do it all the time. Uh, especially if you're trying to achieve something like more oversteer, less oversteer, or if you want to induce a little bit of understeer in some weird situations, that is a thing. So yeah, I encourage people to adjust the front and the rear independent of each other. Absolutely. Okay, uh, we've got MTR and Co. Odie, what's the best way to find proper spring rates? I have a 1JZ S13 with 12K front X, 6K rears. Your input? Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, actually, uh, 12K with uh, on an S chassis with a 1J or a 2J is, is a great starting point. I wouldn't go any softer than that. And then um, we obviously would ask for corner weights if you have them in the front. You're probably at about 750 pounds per corner if you're running a 2J on an S chassis. So 12K is a good starting point um, to get nerdy. That's like a little over two hertz of ride frequency. But um, give us a call. You know, that's something that we love to help you out with. Um, we have guys with 2Js and S chassis competing professionally in Europe and here, you know, with 14K as well. So it really depends how comfortable you are with a little bit of push. Uh, and uh, it's, it's driver preference. Your, your spring racer are, are a good starting point. Okay, so Ryan asks, what are your thoughts on running a digressive valve shock in the front with a linear curve rear shock on a drift car? I think that it works pretty well. Um, we have found instances like looking at data of what a driver likes um, and then going back to the shop and running the, dy the shock on the dyno at that setting. And a lot of time we do find that it it is adjusted out to where it's past that digressive nature. So my first instinct is set up the front of the car like a road race car, right, with digressive valving. But sometimes, you know, I have found in real life that the digressive um, curve isn't really what the drivers prefer all the time. But uh, you can't go too wrong with a slightly digressive front valving on a S chassis, or I'm sorry, on a drift car. Um, but I have, I could tell you that from experience that we have worked with teams that had overly digressive front ends and um, there, there was, there were some problems. So um, a little digression in the front is great. And then fairly linear in the back is, is definitely the way to go. Okay. Here's a fun one from Joseph. Out of everyone you've worked with at FD, who's been the most difficult or unique to work with your coilovers? Which car? Um, I don't think we've had anyone that was difficult to work with. Um, you know, I really enjoyed working with James and Peter from Wardhouse when uh, we actually got two championships with them when they ran field coilovers because those guys were like so just like, oh, yeah, everything's good. But um, deep down, they weren't shy to try different settings either. So, um, you know, we gave them a few different spring rates. And um, it was just a pleasure to see my product being used at, you know, the absolute top level and, and 
uh, even though sometimes when we battled, we would lose <laughs> against him. But um, just seeing that being pushed, the product being pushed so hard and, and getting that um, assurance that, hey, we're on the right path, we're, we're making these cars work really well. I, I think that was probably the most fun. Um, some of the most difficult ones are, are the ones that crash, the ones that, that, that crash their cars and bend the stuff up and then we have to rebuild it for them really quickly. Uh, we rebuild all of our stuff in-house. So, um, yeah, there's always a season where someone is the most commonly crashed up uh, field driver. And I'd say those are the most difficult ones. Okay, so we have four minutes left of questions and they're coming quick and strong. Thank you, everyone. Emmanuel says, on S chassis, stock rear knuckles, the traction rods need to be adjusted. What's the benefit of doing that? Yeah, so if you play with a traction rod length on an S chassis stock knuckle or even drop knuckle. Uh, sometimes that makes the car feel like it's got more or less anti squat. So if you extend it, it feels like it squats more. But one thing that most people don't talk about is that when you change the traction rod length, stock knuckle or aftermarket knuckle, that changes how much it toes in under compression. So sometimes that is what's giving you more or less traction. Um, that and that sensation of taking away or adding anti-squat. So I just encourage people to play with. I think a, like a standard length for a uh, traction rod with stock knuckle was like eight inches back in the day when that was like a thing running stock knuckles. Okay, all right. So one from Michael Mendez, when setting ride height, should both coilovers be the same size? My driver's side is about an inch longer to have equal ride heights. Would that be a preload issue? If your right or left coilover is different in length by a full inch, most likely your spring preload is not symmetrically adjusted. So the coilover that's an inch longer probably has less preload. Uh, remember when I was saying, hey, set ballpark ride height first and make sure that uh, that's within half an inch of where you wanna be and then start adjusting preload. So maybe something happened to where you went in afterwards and started adjusting one, adjusting preload uh, or something got loose and spun down. If in fact your preload is symmetrical, your ride height shouldn't vary a full inch. Please put it on corner balance scales. It's kind of concerning that it's that deviating that much. Uh, I've only seen that happen if the chassis is really, really bent, crashed really, really hard. Um, so double check the spring preload. I have a feeling that your spring preload is not symmetrical and causing you to change the ride height quite a bit. Uh, well, Dylan's asking, can we extend the uh, the live stream? Unfortunately, no, we cannot. But I'm really glad that everyone is enjoying it. What we'd love to hear from you is, what did you get out of today? And what would you like as a follow up? Um, Odie, I had a question for you. Talk a lot about, you know what, call the guys at Field Suspension. Can you talk a little bit about the support or after market support that you yeah. guys get? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Nadine. Um, I was kind of just trying to rush through this. The, uh, the team that I have, you know, is, is a great group of, of guys that um, we hired on and trained them up and used, uh, show them our techniques and empower them with spreadsheets that I've created and calculations that, um, you know, I've created over a decade of working on this. And field suspension is hands-on. So we custom build the coilovers if you, at any point, have an incident like many of us do in formula drift we're in the middle of the season we literally have a, a handful of coilovers to rebuild because of incidents we do that quickly we turn the stuff around so we have really good after sales support and we just care we love motorsports um mike is the guy that picks up the phone whenever you call he's the one that filters most of the emails uh, mike's a great guy he uh, takes care of all of our sponsor drivers and takes care of all of our dealers and our customers. So I feel like when you're buying fuel coilovers, you're kind of joining our family and uh, we, we just we take care of family. So, um, yeah, thanks for, for bringing up that question, Nadine. Well, not only that, Andrew says, I love the 441s on my C6 Corvette and feel has been nothing but extremely helpful. So really good testimonial, guys. Thank you. Um, we had a great audience today. Everyone's come from all around the world. If you want to use a discount code, Odie, what is it? Yeah, so it's really simple. It's Throttle, just like the organization <laughs> that helped set this all up. Um, and I'm going to let it run for about a month. We typically don't have sales. We typically don't have coupon codes, but I think this was a really cool, intimate kind of thing. And I 
want to, you know, kind of give back to the people that join us. And, um, yeah, feel free to use the, the coupon code. Uh, it's right there at the bottom of the screen. So Fantastic. Um, all right, yeah. guys. So, so just so you know, for those of you who entered in the giveaways, I'm about to share my screen and we're going to pick three winners. So Odie has kindly donated three uh, awards here. One is the Falcon field suspension hat that he's wearing. The other is the um, field suspension t-shirt. And we've got a beautiful signed poster from Odie as well. Um, just so you know, this live stream is going to be on his website and also the throttle website for the next couple of weeks. So if you didn't catch it or you had to drop off or something, make sure that you go back and do it. I'm Nadine, the founder of Throttle, and I really appreciate you guys all for coming today. We'd love to see you on the Throttle app um, just because it's our chance to really build this community together. So we had 68 eggs for those of you who were able to um, follow field suspension and OD drift on throttle. So I'm just going to click it. I've only put your throttle usernames on here. So hopefully, please get in touch. The first winner is, let's see, Honda, what is that? Oh, RPKT for RJBZW. That's a difficult okay. one to uh, remember. Yeah, I think what happened was that gentleman might have done it with his Apple ID or something, so it kind of gets a little funky. But please write in the uh, comments below your, your details or reach out to us so we know where to send it. I'll do another one. We have another winner, Donovan777. So please get in touch with us. And the last winner is... Patrick Trishan. Fantastic. Sweet, guys. Well, I look forward to uh, getting uh, the team hat as well as the team shirt to you guys. And uh, Nadine, where do they reach out again to redeem that? Um, absolutely. If you guys want to go, um, you can email us at info at throttle.com. If you saw your name there, please contact us and we will make sure that we get you those prizes. But we will be sending out a survey via email. We'd love to just hear from you, just seeing like what you got out of the session. Again, do you like this type of thing? Would you like it more educational? And let us know because we'd love to put on events for a Throttle App members. So thank you very much, Odie. We really appreciate your time today. And for those of you joining us, I know it's 1 a.m. over there in Lithuania. So thank you for staying up and doing this. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you, guys. Okay, bye.